Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Uh, my name is Deb. I'm a real alcoholic. Hello, everyone. <laughs> what a lovely a group of shining faces to see in the middle of my work day. I, um, oh, let me see. My sobriety date is March 15th, 1987. Um, and for that day and every day after, I'm just insanely grateful. Um, I have a, guys, I, I live a life I wouldn't have known to ask for. Um, I wouldn't have known how to even think to want for some of the things that are in my life today. When I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, I really felt like I was still just like serving a sentence for getting caught. <laughs> I had no idea what you guys actually had in store for me, nor did I know that just following simple instructions would deliver me into this place. Um, it's just, it's just, anyway, just an amazing way of life, isn't it? Um, for those of you who are new or near new, um, welcome to Alcoholics Anonymous. I mean, welcome, like, please come all the way in and sit all the way down, come all the way in and sit all the way down. I promise, I promise that staying sober is easier than getting sober. It doesn't mean that life doesn't get hard in my, in my uh, in my life, I have been through incredible joy and incredible sorrow um, and stayed sober through both of them. And I've stayed sober through all of just the regular kind of menial days in between. Um, and, it, and it really is a life worth living. So if you're new or near new, welcome. Welcome. Come all the way in, please. I, um, I get to talk about steps two and three, which I dearly love. I dearly love steps two and three. I, you know, the, um, you know, everybody's like, oh, you know, each of the steps is, is just as important as the other one. And I agree with you. They're all really important. You know, thank God um, that Bill was able to partner with Dr. Bob um, in writing and editing and delivering to us the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous inside the content of our book. Um, and that partnership was incredibly important. I'm sitting here in Akron, Ohio, which is, of course, the place where it all began. Um, and but that partnership was incredibly important because, you know, if like if when you when, when you come, not if you come, when you come to Dr. Bob's house to visit, if I am your tour guide, which I am likely to be, if you let me know you're coming ahead of time, when you walk in that front door, I will say, welcome home. Welcome home to the spiritual home of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I call this the spiritual home of Alcoholics Anonymous because as all of you know who have studied our history even a little bit, um, Dr. Bob wasn't the big structure guy. Dr. Bob was the guy who said, let's keep this thing simple and let's trust God, clean house and help others, right? Let's just do the grassroots work. Let's sit knee to knee with another alcoholic and let's teach him how to pray right? Dr. Bob is the one that said we cannot shy away from the spiritual matter. If we do, we will lose them. Like we get it. People come to Alcoholics Anonymous in all kinds of fit states when it comes to spiritual things. <laughs> I mean, we're just, we, you know, we, we really are the worldwide fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous, right? And so I have literally, I've gotten to sponsor lots of Christians, a couple of atheists, um, a couple of Muslims, a couple of folks who uh, were following the Jewish faith, um, and one gentleman who was Hindu. And I am telling you, I have learned something from every single spiritual walk, and I'm and I have been blessed. My my experience of God has been enhanced and been blessed because you all bring your spiritual struggles to Alcoholics Anonymous and you share them with me. And you are also, you know, willing to say, I don't believe and I'm not willing to believe. <laughs> and I say, okay, well, you know what, at least now we know where we're starting. Um, and really, that's all that's asked of us in step two is that our, you know, do I believe or am I now willing to believe that there is a power greater than myself? And then if I believe that there's a power greater than myself, do I believe that that power actually has enough power to deliver me from the seemingly hopeless state of mind and body, right? Do I believe or am I even willing to believe that this is possible? 
right? Because I do steps two and three and, and because they have depth and weight with me and because they have grown over the almost 35, well, I've been around for 35 years, almost 35 years of sobriety that I've been doing this thing. It doesn't make me a spiritual giant. God knows. I mean, talk to people who actually know me. <laughs> it doesn't make me a spiritual giant. What it does make me is a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous who has a very alive relationship with my higher power. I am, that's David, who you see, who you see walking around. He's a friend of mine, uh, one of us, one of our tribe visiting from Las Vegas. So if he's popping in and out, it's just because he's fidgeting in the background. Um, but, but my experience with two and three has never made me a spiritual giant. My experience with the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous doesn't make me a spiritual giant. What steps two and three did was it delivered me into a relationship with a God who had been pursuing me my entire life. It delivered me into a relationship with God. And quite frankly, I'm pretty sure today that God doesn't care how I perceive him. I'm pretty sure that God doesn't care what name I use for him or her. I'm pretty sure that the only thing God cares about is that I know that God exists and that I seek and participate in a relationship with God. But guys, oh my God, that was a tall order when I got here, <laughs> right? No pun intended, right? It was just a really tall order when I got here. I was, um, I was not born and raised uh, going to church. I was not taught how to pray. Uh, the only higher power I had any experience with at all in my life was alcoholism and my father's case of it. Um, I was absolutely surviving alcoholism and surviving him and his moods and his temper and his just, oh my gosh, right? I mean, just what a powerful disease this is. And I had been, I the, my very first higher power was my dad, his temper and his alcoholism. And so when I got here, I didn't know how to pray. I didn't know why folks went to church necessarily. I walked by a couple of churches on my way to school every day. I would watch people go in and out of the Catholic. I didn't think you could become Catholic unless you were born one, <laughs> right? I had no idea that you could actually just walk into a Catholic church and become one. I mean, how shocking was that, right? And that, and that literally you can walk in and you can actually learn how to become part of any faith community that you desire. I didn't know any of that when I got here. Right. So I, when I walked into Alcoholics Anonymous and you guys were like holding hands and praying and open, op, you open meetings with prayers, you close meetings with prayers, you use the Lord's prayer. There's a lot of words in the Lord's prayer. I didn't know any of those. Right. I had to learn. I had to learn everything when I got here. And, and guys, I really think um, that in my case, that was the blessed position. Because I didn't have, I didn't think I had a lot of unlearning to do. I didn't, I didn't come in here saying, I know, I know, I know, I know when it came to spiritual matters, because I didn't know anything. And so I didn't have to unlearn a lot of stuff. I didn't come in here on the backside of a religion that had, that had taught me that there was a right side and a wrong side to everything. Now I had plenty of black and white thinking, but it wasn't in the spiritual arena. I had plenty of, of experience being judgmental and harsh and critical, but it wasn't in the spiritual arena. I had plenty of fear that bled over into the spiritual arena, but I didn't know it. The beautiful thing was when I came into Alcoholics Anonymous and when the old timers who were getting me sober, they, they didn't make too hard of terms with those who, who sought them either. They showed up at my door every single night at seven o'clock and they waited for me to just get in the car. And after every meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, they took me to a donut shop and we sat around and we talked about what we had just talked about at a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. We rehashed it, right? Because they were pretty good that, or they, they were pretty sure that us newcomers were stupid. And so they wanted to go over it a second and sometimes a third time just to make sure that we were actually learning what, what they wanted us to learn. Oh, but once uh, they spent a lot of time with me in the doctor's opinion, because they wanted to make sure that I understood what alcoholism really was, right? Because if I, if I tried to define my alcoholism by lining up my consequences of drunkenness with your consequences of drunkenness, I was going to be able to compare myself out to Alcoholics Anonymous. But if we talked about the fact that I had a head that was talking me into drinking against my own best interest 
and a body that couldn't take it. That's something that I could start to understand, right? The phenomena of craving was not difficult for me to identify with at all. But if I had to, if I had to identify the phenomena of craving through a series of consequences I hadn't yet experienced, I wouldn't have had a seat in Alcoholics Anonymous. I would have given it up. So once they got me through the first step and I became convinced to my innermost self that I had this thing called alcoholism, right? That was the first surrender is that I had it. The second surrender in Alcoholics Anonymous is that I had to surrender to the idea that this was the treatment for it. <laughs> and I was going to have to do what you said. Oh, right. Talk about it. Oh, what an order. I almost couldn't go through with it. Right. But um, anyway, I was getting I was getting sobered up by a bunch of people um, who all they would all tell the same stories, but they would tell them very differently. And some people I could hear and some people I couldn't hear. And thank God I had a God squad. That's what I call them, right? They were my God squad. They were my Tuesday night crew and my Thursday night crew. Those were the folks who were coming to get me and take me to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And they never missed a day. And I knew that when they picked me up, we were going to talk about God all the way to the meeting. We were going to sit through the meeting and then we were going to go to the donut shop and we were going to talk about God some more. And so I called them my God squad. And when we were sitting at that donut shop, they, they taught me that you take all of your troubles, all of your worries, you take all those to the donut shop and we'll sort them out when we get there. Right. So you don't sort them out in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. That's not the place for it. You sort them out at the donut shop afterwards. And so I would, I started to trust these people because they were showing up in my driveway every single night of the week, whether I wanted them there or not right? They were sitting there waiting for me to get in the car. I mean, they were driving 30 minutes out of their way to come and pick me up and then taking me to a meeting, then taking me to the donut shop and then dropping me off. And then they still had to go 30 minutes to get back to their house because I was living in a rural area right outside of Akron, Ohio. And these people, I knew that they were sacrificing for me. And they didn't ask me for my for gas money or my own cup of coffee or to buy my own donut, right? Because they knew where they were picking me up from. They knew that I didn't have any means. But they also knew that I needed to be part of you more than I needed air. And so my God squad, they would show up and we would go to the donut shop afterwards and we would talk about God some more. And I started to take my problems to the donut shop like I was taught to do, right? And I was taught to do that, not because they told me, this is where you bring your problems, but because they showed me by talking about things that were bothering them and having conversations that had depth and weight. They taught me by not withholding anything. There were grown men who were tired, retired steel workers who were talking about being afraid at the donut shop. Those guys don't talk about being afraid at all, let alone in a group of people at a donut shop. But they demonstrated to me that you can absolutely take everything into the donut shop after a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous and put it on the table and we'll sort it out. And when I was taking my stuff in there, my God squad, they, there was this guy, goodness knows, he just said ev like every day, did you pray about it? 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 And I said, I don't know how. And he said, give me your book. And I slid my book across the table and he opened it and he highlighted and underlined every tiny little prayer that's between pages 60 and 90 in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And there's a bunch of them. And he closed the book and he pushed it back and he said, pick one and try it. It doesn't matter which one. And one of the other, other old guys said, on your knees. And isn't it a miracle that one of the first things we do once we surrender to the treatment that is Alcoholics Anonymous is that we start doing what we're told, <laughs> right? Don't tell me there aren't, out, there aren't miracles in Alcoholics Anonymous because <laughs> the fact that they would tell me to do something and when they weren't looking, I would do it anyway. That was a miracle at that point because I was so obstinate and would fight against anything I was told. But for some reason, if those old timers would tell me to do something, I would follow through and do it. It's just fascinating. And they got me on my knees at the side of my bed with my big book open, finding one of those prayers that was underlined and highlighted. 
and I would close one eye so that I could read the prayer because I didn't want to get it wrong, right? Because I didn't know anything about God and I didn't know if there was a right way or a wrong way, right? If I screwed it up and said thee instead of thou, like, you know, was that going to be a problem? And um, anyway, I started to participate in a relationship with a God that I didn't believe in. But that's the beauty of the second step of Alcoholics Anonymous, it says, came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Came to believe. Guys, I came to believe that there was a power greater than me. Like, I, right? My experience of the power greater than me, I knew that there were the things in this world that had greater power than I did, right? That wasn't the problem. The problem was coming to believe that there was a power that had, that was a, a power greater than me in this world that actually wanted the best for me that was powerful enough to deliver a life that was worth living to me, that there was a power that would lead me out of this weird existence I was living in, where I was just drinking my face off and laying face down in mud puddles and, and <laughs> you know, living that life that we live where I'm crawling out of a blackout every morning, wondering what in the world was going on and how I was going to survive another day of consequences. But because you all came and got me and took me to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous and took me to the donut shop afterwards and you talked freely about God, I came to believe that you believed. And some of you had not believed before you got to AA either, but some of you did. But I came to believe that you believed. And the more I got to know you, the more I trusted you. And the more I trusted you, the more I followed you. You see, this is why it's important that we do what we say we're going to do in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, in the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous, and in our lives, because we don't know who's watching us or why. And I was watching you. Not because I thought you were a spiritual giant, but because you were living a life that seemed to work and I wanted one of those. And you said that God was a really big part of having a life that worked. And I wanted to know how, how you came to believe that that was true. And so you taught me how to pray. You taught me how to pray to a God that I didn't believe in. And you let me borrow your concepts of God, right? My sponsor did a couple of things, right? She said, I want you to write down everything that you remember being told about God. Write down everything you remember ever being told about God. And I was like, huh, okay, right? Like every way that he was going to judge and condemn and send you to hell for all of this bad, like, like whatever it was I had picked up on, whether it was in a movie or somebody told me or I heard it at school or, or you know, there was a, 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 an evangelist who said it out loud and somehow I picked it up. I needed to write down everything that I had ever believed to be true about God. And so I had that list of stuff. And then I would, and then I would sit at the donut shop and I would talk to people about what their concept of God was. And you, and, and everyone that I sat with at the donut shop, they would share with me what their concept of God was. And I was blessed in that I was surrounded with people who had really clearly defined concepts of God because they were also participating in either the Catholic religion or they were Amish or they were Baptist or something like that. And so there was this really clear concept of God, right? And it was the Trinity, right? It was, you know, God and the Holy, Holy Spirit and Jesus. It was this Trinity. And so that was one idea of God that I was introduced to um, and, and, and everybody believed in that basic thing, but then the way they got to it was very different, but you all shared those concepts of God with me. And then I was hanging out with the, at the same donut shop with people who were not religious at all, but they, they believed in the spiritual energy of the world and the fact that the energy connected all of us. And I like that a lot. And then I, and then there was a guy and he said, you know, the only place I can feel God is when I'm fishing. And so nature was his, right? And so I was just introduced to all of these different concepts of God. And what I was taught through that and through a couple of other things is that the, the road to God really is broad, roomy and all inclusive, right? Because all of these people were staying sober. 
all of these people were living lives that seemed to work a, a heck of a lot better than what they were doing when they were out there drinking, right? And some of these people were sober a long time, and they were able to describe to me what their concept of God was early on and what their concept of God had become through the years. And I was like, oh, so I don't have to drop anchor with my first concept of God. I just need a starting point. And then God is going to become something very different through the application of the spiritual principles of Alcoholics Anonymous. What an incredible promise that is, huh? What an incredible promise that is. And so in my starting point, I just took, you know, some attributes from a couple of different people's concept of God and cobbled them together and got on my knees at my bedside and opened my book and read those little prayers with one eye open. And that was really how I started on the spiritual path that is the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I came to believe that there was a power greater than me who could restore me to sanity because there was clearly a power greater than you that had restored you to sanity. And so I came to believe because you believed. And little by slow, the more I partnered with God effectively, the easier my life became to live right? It's like when you learn how to live by spiritual principles, things get easier, right? When you learn how to not lie so much, life gets easier because, because you're living transparently. And that's a spiritual movement. Anyway, I got my start, right? I gave birth to this concept of God. And, um, and one of the old timers said, well, now that you think that maybe possibly you have a belief and a concept in God, right? God, God is right. God exists. And I was like, yeah, 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 yeah. God, God exists. And he's like, okay, now you just got to trust him. <laughs> I was like, trust him, trust him with what? And he said, trust him with everything. And I was like, "What? oh no, 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 no. And he was like, no, no, you have to trust him with everything. And thank God there were more people at the donut shop that night. And they said, but you don't have to start out trusting him with for everything. But you are going to have to go all in with him. Because in step three, right, that's where I form the deal with God. In step three, that's where I say, okay, God, okay, you exist. I'm down with that. Apparently, you have a plan for my life. That's what they're telling me. I'm going to choose to believe that that's true, right? This is an intellectual process. I'm going to choose to believe that not only that you exist, but that you have a plan for my life. And apparently, I'm going to choose to believe that you're nice. Okay, so we're going to go all in with that, right? You exist. You got a plan. You're nice. That's a start. Now, making a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him. Okay. Now, thank goodness that they explained to me, right, that I am not turning over my will and my life to God without also noting that I'm turning it over to God's care. And what, it, what do I do for something when I care for something? I include it. I'm kind. I protect it. I look out for it. I surround it with goodness. I think about it. Even when I don't have to. If I care for you, you're in my inner circle. If I care for you, when I see something really great hit my morning meditation feed, your face pops in my mind. Because getting you the beautiful thing that I just read is a caring thing to do. When I have an extra 20 bucks in my pocket, the face of the person that I care for who's on hard times, their face will pop in. And I'll be like, oh, I hope they're at the meeting tonight so that I can treat them to dinner afterwards. Because I'm going to give you, I'm going to share with you everything that I have that's of value if I care for you. If I care for you, I'm going to be interested in the plan for your life. 
right? If I care for you, I'm going to say, hey, how'd that job interview go? Hey, did you get accepted into that program that you were going for at work? Hey, are you a junior in college now or a senior? When are we planning your graduation party? Oh, what do you mean you had to drop out? Why is that? Is there something I can do to be helpful? If I care for you, I'm going to pay attention to your life and to what's actually going on in it. So I know, because I'm not a bad person, even when I was new, right? What's that? The road to hell is paved with good intentions, right? I'm right. I have great intentions, right? So I know how to care for people. I'm just not really great at follow through when I'm new, but I'm, but I certainly know what it is. And I'm really good at it today. But what I'm doing here is I'm turning my will in my life. I'm turning my thoughts and my actions in this world over to God's care, which means that I'm essentially handing God the way I see you and the way I see the world. And I'm going to allow him to mold it so that I can see it in a way that is beneficial to you and to me. And I'm going to take a minute between that thing happening and me responding to it. I'm going to take a minute. I'm going to breathe because in my breath, I am saying the name of God and I'm going to allow him to get in on that action before I do something. And God is not going to steer me wrong because I don't steer people wrong if I care for them. Not intentionally. It is always my intention that your life is better because I'm in it. That's caring for people. And to me, that's a really important part of step three. Because I don't, I, guys, though, I was raised in active alcoholism, right? Most of you have never heard my story before, but I was raised in active alcoholism, where people who were supposed to care for me couldn't, or wouldn't. And so when I came to you, when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, not only didn't, did I not know how to pray or have a relationship with God, but I didn't know how to trust you either. I didn't know how to trust that the people who were supposed to care for me actually would or could, because that hadn't been my experience. And that's why this community that we build, this community that we participate in, this community that where we experience true belonging, that's why this community is so important, right? That's why this, that's why inside this community that we live in, it's important that the community is, is glued together by the spirit. It cannot be glued together by a lot of extra rules. It cannot be glued together by a lot of judgmentalism and harsh, critical interpretation of things. This community of Alcoholics Anonymous that we belong to has to be really bonded together by the spirit because we don't shoot our wounded. And when we come to Alcoholics Anonymous and we are faced with these spiritual matters at this initial pass, we are asking people to do things that they don't know how to do, <laughs> right? Not only are we saying, right, get this concept of God and then go all in with it. But we're also saying, and trust us that this is the way to go. When for most of us, our experience is that people can't show up for us when it really matters. So you're asking me to trust you and then trust you that you trust it. And I can't even see it. That's why we have to be glued together by the spirit, because it is the spirit that enables the spiritual experience to take root. It is the spirit that delivers me into a position where I am even willing to believe that maybe possibly there's a thing that has the ability and the means 
to care for me and that actually wants to partner with me. We're asking a lot. Now, I understand that the desperation of alcoholism delivers most of us to Alcoholics Anonymous where we are wide open and willing to give it a go because what do we got to lose? Right? The gift of desperation. <laughs> right? That's the reason why we begin on this spiritual stuff. Right? I love that. Well, that's the spiritual part of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'm like, no, no, I'm pretty sure the whole thing's spiritual, but that's a debate for the other for another day. Right? But that's why we start on the spiritual stuff in steps two and three, and we don't wait. Right? Can you imagine if we tried to get somebody to actually do inventory before they had a sense of the spirit? If we, if we thrust people into the structure of inventory and amends and all of that without first introducing them and giving them a sense of the spirit, this would be an intellectual exercise and we might never get to the actual beginnings of the spiritual experience that deliver us into this life worth living, right? Into the spiritual experience that enables us to change everything over time deliver us into this spiritual experience that puts us in a neutral position where alcohol is concerned so that this thing is no longer about drinking. Because my life isn't about not drinking, guys. I could care less about booze. I could care less about booze. Drink around me, don't drink around me. I don't care. I know who I am. I know what I am. I know who I belong to. I know that I'm part of you. I have been placed in a position of neutrality and my position of neutrality hasn't changed for decades. It just isn't about not drinking. Right. But I also understand that, you know, probably, I don't know, 80, 85% of the people I met in Alcoholics Anonymous, they're going to be perfectly happy with physical sobriety and a few new friends. Right. It's a pretty good place to start, but I want it all. I want it all. I want a life that has purpose that doesn't end. I want a life that has depth and weight. I want, I want to be able to participate in the lives of my fellows in a way that is so genuine and so transparent that I am, that, that I am connected and that I belong without question and that you're connected and that you belong without question. I want it all. I want to really believe that I cannot be separated from God because God is me. That I cannot be separated from the spirit because without the spirit, there is no breath in me. That I can't choose that God is nothing because I can no longer live in a lie. And the truth, it says in our book, God is either everything or he is nothing. What is your, what is your choice to be? I can't choose that God is nothing because the body of evidence that he is everything has mounted up. And I'm now one of those old timers at the diner after the meeting telling you stories about the things that God has done in my life so that you can begin to trust my body of evidence so that maybe possibly you'll take a risk and give it a go. And then, and then your body of evidence will begin to mount. And 30 years from now, you'll be the old timer sitting at the diner, sharing your body of evidence with people who, who are unbelievers or who used to believe. And because they attributed the behavior of man to God, they've chosen to separate themselves from God. And there's healing that needs to take place. These spiritual concepts, we are asking a lot. And over time, over time, there's so much incredible stuff here. But initially, we're just saying, hey, guys, we know how to stay sober. You don't. So come and hang out with us and do what we do. And you know what we do? We choose to believe in God. We choose to believe in God. What do you think? I, I love God. I believe in God. I live a life. Do you want a life like mine? 
you want a life where you're, you know, where your bills are paid and you're reasonably happy and you can, you know, stop in and visit your family and any of your friends and you can make eye contact with anybody you see on the street. You want that kind of life? Those are the basics here. If you want that kind of life, you got to come and do what I do. And what I do is I believe in God. Why do I believe in God? Because God has done all of this. You want to sit with me for a while and we'll sort through my body of evidence. I'm happy to share it with you. We'll open the file cabinet. Oh, you want to talk about 10 years ago? I can go 10 years back. Absolutely. Oh, you want to talk about yesterday? Yeah, yesterday. I got some stories from yesterday. Right? Pick a topic. I got a file for that. You want to talk about God at work? I got that. You want to talk about God in relationships with family? I got that. You want to talk about God in romantic relationships? I got that. You want to talk God in the sitting around stillness? I got that. You want to talk about the kind of God that's walking around, connected with everybody, and allows me to see that connectedness? I got that. Step three is about choosing to take a risk and actually trust the relationship that we're just starting to build. And the first truly risky thing, right? Because <laughs> when we make a decision, right? There is no decision without action. And the first thing that we do, the first action that, that we are asked to take, once we state that we are willing, is God says, okay, so um, sit down with this sponsor and she's gonna give you a notepad and a pen and you're just gonna write some stuff down. And you'll be all right, I promise, you'll be all right. Right. But because I'm introduced to the world of the spirit and because this community of ours is glued together by the spirit, I'm willing to sit with my sponsor with that piece of paper and that pen. And I'm willing to start to take a look at the life that I've been living because I have to know what I'm throwing away to make room for the new stuff. And I can't do that if I don't do the inventory but that's what I'm actually asked to do. And guys, what I can tell you too, is that, um, so that's kind of all of that beginning kinds of stuff, right? But what I can also tell you, and I don't think I, I, don't, I know I don't talk about it very often, um, but when I was nine years sober, I went on a horrific dry drunk, <laughs> just a horrific dry drunk. And you're not going to get all those details, right? Um, you're not going to get all those details. Maybe if you were sitting with me at the donut shop, right, we would swap some stories, but you're not getting the details. And my friend, Mary Helen from Mississippi is on here and she's smiling really big because she was around shortly after I got out of the dry drunk. Um, but anyway, so I went on this horrific dry drunk. And in order for me to get out of that dry drunk, I had to go back to step two. I had to go back to step two because there was something in my current concept of God that I was unwilling to trust again, right? My relationship with the spirit waxes and wanes. My relationship with the spirit, it, it's, just, it, it's just up and down, right? It is my job to have a spiritual practice that will establish a constant connection, whether I'm feeling it or not feeling it, right? But when I hit that dry drunk, I wasn't able to pray. I wasn't able to sit still. I wasn't able to breathe again. My skin didn't fit. AA wasn't doing it for me anymore. I just hit a spot. And it was a scary spot. And I didn't, I didn't know how dangerous it was. And what happened for me is that I had to go back to step two. And I had to make another new list everything that I had ever been told and that I could remember that I had been told about God. And now the list was longer because I had been in Alcoholics Anonymous for nine years. And so my list got longer on the plus side, but there was still some stuff buried on the, on the negative side. And the bottom line is right. The work that I had been doing in step six and seven around being willing to act better and, <laughs> and sit all the way down with God, right? Being willing to act differently, even when my fear was triggered, 
it was easier for me at nine years to walk backwards and to start to trust some old behaviors. And when I started to trust some old behaviors again, right, because the immediacy was that I felt better for a minute. When I did that, I was unwilling to sit in the presence of God again. Right. I went back to that old belief system that if I just don't pray, maybe I'll stay off of his radar. <laughs> right. Maybe, maybe I can avoid the judgment. But my spiritual life fell apart. And that's the definition of a dry drunk. Right. Stopped going to very many meetings, stopped my spiritual practice, no longer was willing or able to trust God and believed for some reason. I chose to believe that God was going to be harsh and judgmental with me, that for some reason there were some things that God had never forgiven, even though I had told you that he had. I believe that there were some stuff that had happened to me and that I had participated in when I was drinking that had never been forgiven and that I had actually had never been delivered onto the backside of that. And so I had to go back into all of that stuff and see what was left. Because it was really clear to me at the nine-year mark that I needed a new concept of God. And I'm grateful that there, there have always been people in my life who were growing spiritually around me, and I, and I got to experience that with them. There were always people in my life who were growing spiritually. And so I was able to turn myself into, into somebody and say, look, I'm dying here again, and I don't know what's going on, but I can't sit still in my own skin, and I can't pray anymore, and I can't trust God anymore. And they said, well, let's go back to step two, and let's see where you're stuck. Because every time someone goes into a dry drunk, it, there's something in step two that needs to be uncovered. And I've had to do that multiple times in my sobriety, multiple times in my sobriety. I have to go back into step two and take a look at and redefine and allow the concept of God, allow the way I see and experience God to become something different. And I told you at the very beginning of this, I wasn't raised in church. I wasn't brought up in a faith group. I wasn't just none of that. And when I hit that nine year mark, I realized that there are some things that I had heard that had come from people of organized religion and I had never owned that those things were in my mind before. And so I had to go back and I had to unpack that stuff. And the stuff that I had picked up from organized religion, and I am not here to bash on it because there is a lot of good in organized religion, but the stuff that was sticking for me was the really harsh, the really judgmental, the really black and white, the dualistic thinking, the right or wrong, the you're going to heaven or hell kind of things. And that stuff was buried so deep that I didn't see it when I got here. But when I was nine years sober, it was bubbling to the top. And so I had to go back into step two and I had to actually do a spiritual inventory on where I was at with my concept of God. And I had to, and I had to allow God to grow in my life. And I had to overcome and lay down my bias against organized religion. I had to lay down my bias against spiritual terms. I had to lay down, right, the right and left lateral limits of who God was allowed to be in my life. Because that's what my concept of God had become. I had put God in a box. But the life that God had laid out for me to live meant that he needed to be able to operate outside of those parameters. But I had put I had put my spiritual life in a box and I had, and I had, and I don't even know how I got there. Right. But just one day I wake up and I'm like, what is going on? Right. And I have this God that that's, that's in this square. And I'm like, man, that's not what I ever wanted, but there it is. Right. And so being willing to say, yeah, I have this really limited concept of God again. And they're like, well, what's that about? I'm like, I don't know. And here was the thing. We uncovered this story. My sponsor just point blank. She looked at me and she said, why do you hate organized religion? I was like, I don't hate organized religion. She said, could you please just try to be honest? 
<laughs> right? Why do you hate organized religion? And I was like, well, I wasn't raised in it. So I've never been part of it. Why would I hate it? And she said, tell me about a time when you interacted significantly with church folk and it didn't go well. And all of a sudden it was there. I was a little kid. I was running my posse in my neighborhood, right? Because I run everything I touch, right? So I've got a posse, right? Me and all the neighborhood kids. And we would play in this church parking lot because it had two levels. And so it was great to roller skate and skateboard in. And it was just up the hill from my house. And it was where we started all of our sled rides. You know, our sledding runs started at the top of the hill and came down. And so we were in this church parking lot all the time. And this woman came out one day, this, you know, one of the little old church ladies, she pops out and she, and she's been watching us and she can clearly see that I'm the leader of the posse, right? So she calls me over and she says, Hey, she said, we're starting a program for all the neighborhood kids. She said, why don't you go talk to the other kids and see if you want, would want to come in and do this? And I said, well, what is it? And she said, well, we're going to give, you know, we'll give you snacks and juice and stuff. And we're going to teach you basic Bible stories and we'll do skits and stuff. It'll be fun. It'll just be for an hour and a half or so on Wednesdays. And it's called the M&M Club. I don't know why it was the M&M Club, but it was. And I said, all right, I'll go talk, right? And so I went over and we huddled up and I was like, look, it's free snacks. And winter's coming, so it might not be bad to be able to go indoors, right? And so we decided as a posse that we were going to go in and we were going to do this thing with this church. And we were going to get free snacks. And so we went in and did that and they taught us Bible stories and they put us into skits and all kinds of stuff. We're little kids. So it was a lot of fun. Right. And we got juice and cookies and whatnot. And so all in all, you know, it was a pretty, pretty positive experience, but they used to tell us a lot. They were trying to teach us about this love that about the fact that God was all powerful and he was also loving all powerful and loving and God could overcome anything and God could change people's hearts and God could deliver you from, from the worst possible circumstances. And at the time I'm living in my father's active alcoholism and I'm getting beaten on a daily basis for doing nothing but breathing. And I'm hurting all the time and I need somebody to make my life different. And I think to myself, when I'm eight, well, if God's so big, why isn't he coming to save me? I'm showing up for him. Why isn't he showing up for me? And he never came. In my eight-year-old mind, he never came. And I thought, oh, another place where they talk a good game, but they don't deliver. And my bias against organized religion sat down in the middle of my soul. And guys, I had no idea it was there. And when I'm nine years sober, I'm unpacking. And there it was. And we got to walk through that experience. And I got to look at that as someone who was at that point, 24 years old, rather than eight. And I got to understand that during that hour and a half on Wednesday nights, I was in a place where it was safe, where there was heat, where there were snacks, and nobody was beating on me. So maybe I was actually resting in the arms of God. We don't know what's there. And spiritual growth is a requirement in this thing. And the, the willingness to go all in, the willingness to dig, the willingness to sit quietly and say, gosh, what is it that I have put between me and God this time? That's the next necessary maneuvering here, folks. Because we have to continue to grow spiritually. I have to over and over and over. Come to believe that a power greater than myself could restore me to sanity, no matter what kind of insanity I'm dealing with. I have to come to believe over and over and over 
in the power of God. And then I have to, from time to time, sit down and have a heart to heart with them and say, I haven't been talking to you very much recently. And I'm not really sure what that's about, but I don't think you and I are on good terms right now. So I think that we need to look at the terms of this deal and to hit refresh. What do you say? And God will always find a way to wrap me up and say, I'm in, kid. Come all the way in and sit all the way down. We'll get through this together. Steps two and three, they're growth steps. They're not maintenance steps. I don't want to maintain. If I maintain, I'm going to get bored. This is part of how I grow. But I have to courageously enter into them from time to time and unpack them with somebody different in a new way and come at them a little differently. I think I'm almost out of time. I think we're good. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.